Good evening, welcome. Welcome to this online program of the American Writers Museum and Remy Bumpo Theater Company. I'm Allison Sansoni, I'm the program director at the American Writers Museum. We're so glad you've all joined us and I have a few short housekeeping notes for you before we begin this evening. So we'll go over those while everyone is filing into the room and finding their seats, so to speak. The American Writers Museum's exhibits and programs include all kinds of writing from journalism and advertising copy to poets and of course, playwrights. If you like learning new things about writers from our history, as well as hearing from the writers of our present and inspiring the writers of the future, you can join us as a member in person at our Chicago location or online at AmericanWritersMuseum.org. If you have a question for our presenters tonight while the program is happening, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring that for questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have tonight. Thank you all for being here and for valuing the words of American writers. We're here tonight in celebration of a play about change, struggle, and joy. Remy Bumpo Theater Company's ongoing production of Blues for an Alabama Sky tells the story of true love and big dreams in 1930s Harlem. Here to speak with us tonight are playwright Pearl Clegg and Remy Bumpo artistic director Marty Lyons. Marty most recently directed the world premiere of Galileo's Daughter by Jessica Dickey at Remy Bumpo Theater Company. She also recently directed the Cole world premiere of Wife of a Salesman by Eleanor Burgess at Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Sense and Sensibility adapted by Jessica Swale at American Players Theater and the world premiere of John Proctor is the Villain by Kimberly Bellflower at Studio Theater in DC. Marty's art the artistic director of Remy Bumpo and a member of SDC. Pearl Clegg is an Atlanta-based writer, currently distinguished artist in residence at the Alliance Theater. She's also the city's first poet laureate. Her plays include Flyin' West, Blues for an Alabama Sky, Angry, Raucous, and Shamelessly Gorgeous, the Nakarima Society, and What I Learned in Paris. She's the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Dramatists Guild and was honored by Actors' Equity and Actors' Equity's Equity Foundations with the Paul Robeson Award for 2022. Her new play, Something Moving, a meditation on Maynard, is currently in production at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. She's also the author of eight novels, including the New York Times bestseller and Oprah Book Club pick, what looks like crazy on an ordinary day, a memoir, Things I Should Have Told My Daughter, Lies, Lessons, and Love Affairs, and several books of poetry, including We Speak Your Names, written with her husband, author Zarin W. Burnett. Clegg and Burnett are frequent collaborators, including their 10-year performance series, Live at Club Zebra, and a picture book for children, In My Granny's Garden. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you, Pearl. Thank you so much for joining us. What a pleasure to get to speak with you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, all right, I'm just gonna dive right in. Uh, <laughs> my first question for you here is knowing the incredible breadth and scope of work that you have created uh, over years, I'm wondering when your passion for writing began. Um, I think I'm really fortunate um, in that I always knew um, I wanted to write. Um, one of my earliest memories is being a little kid in a crib, so I must have been about two, leaning over the side of the crib, telling a story to my sister who was four. And she stopped to listen to me, so I always tell her it's all her fault because I <laughs> was so impressed with myself for being able to make a four-year-old stop and listen. But I, I always knew I wanted to write. Um, my sister taught me how to read. Um, when I was four and she was six and I started writing um, stories in little notebooks. Uh, my grandfather would buy me these little notebooks and little pencils and I would um, write stories so that I'd done it um, all my life. And I, I really think that that was a great advantage because some people want to write, but they can't really give themselves permission to do it. And I was so young when I knew I wanted to do it that the idea of denying myself the right to do it never occurred to me. So that I've, I've been very, um, very lucky that I came here 
with that desire um, to be a storyteller and was able to land in a family that that respected that and nurtured that in me. So I've I've always done it my whole life. Wow. That the crib story is amazing. <laughs> I wish I had some of those little notebooks. I cannot imagine <laughs> what my stories were about, but they do not exist. They're lost. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, okay. Over the course of your artistic journey, um, I'm sure there were many moments that led you to becoming the artist that you are today, but are there a few that pop to mind that are formative for you? Um, I think probably one of the, uh, one of the things that early on was, was really important for me is that my mother was a big fan of Langston Hughes. And she used to read to us um, at bedtime from Langston Hughes' uh, first autobiography, *The Big C*, the way other married, the way other mothers would read fairy tales to their children. So that I grew up listening to my mother reading the words of Langston Hughes, um, and thinking about the fact that this was someone who was so deeply rooted in being an African American person. But from that grounding. He was able to embrace the whole world, to travel the whole world, to go to places where they had never even met an African-American person. So that that I think that kind of um, ability to be uh, fully a part of the culture that you're born into, but not to see that in any way as a limitation um, in the way that Hughes did so that you can embrace it and love it and nurture it and then take who you really are all over the world. And I think that really um, was something that started me um, thinking about what it meant to be a writer, what it meant to be someone who was a part of a community um, of people, but could also widen um, that community. At the beginning of that book, Langston Hughes is going into the Merchant Marines and he's taken all these books, he's packed all these books, packed all these books. And he's at the, as the ship pulls away, he's looking um, over the side. And he thinks to himself, I am tired of this. I've been living in books. I want to live my life. I really want to be in the world. And he took all his books and threw them overboard into the water. Wow. And I remember as a little kid thinking to myself, his mother's going to kill him. You know, you can't throw books in the water like that. And my mother was explaining to me why he had done that. You know, what, um, what the reason um, was for him to be um, not dishonoring the books, really, but just to say you can't only live in your brain. You know, you have to also experience things. Um, my mother was a big part, I think, of me giving myself permission um, to write. And she took me to see Raisin in the Sun when I was like 11 years old. It was a touring company um, from New York. And I went with my mother and my stepfather and my sister to see Raisin in the Sun. And it was just a transformative experience for me because it was packed. All of us were in there. My neighbors were in there. We were so excited. And after the show was over, we stood up and we all must have screamed and applauded for like 15 minutes, hoping against hope that they would come back and do the show again, the whole thing, which of course they wouldn't do. But it was that, that moment leaving that play. And I said to my mother, I want to write plays like that. And my mother said, then that's what you should do which I think is such a great mother answer. She didn't say, take some education courses. That's not practical. You'll never be able to make a living. She said, then that's what you should do, um, which is the best kind of permission that, you know, that a, an adored parent can give you to say, well, do it then. You know, I'm with you. Go ahead, do it. That's incredible. And um, I had an experience at the theater at Blues for an Alabama Sky the other night where the audience leapt to their feet and applauded. Oh my goodness, I love hearing that. <laughs> so that's um so you that you did go on to write plays that had the same response. How beautiful that your mother knew that you could and that you knew that too, so young. It's amazing. Um you write in so many different forms and styles. How do you decide which content lives in which medium? Um, sometimes it, it really is determined by the story. Um, I never would have written a novel. I, I love writing plays. I've, I've also written a lot of poetry. I love writing poetry. I never thought about writing novels. Novels are a completely different world to me. Um, but I had an idea for a story that was too big to be a play. It had too many characters, too many settings, too much stuff that you really can't put um, on the stage so that I decided to try to write it um, as a novel. Uh, but it was very difficult uh, initially because, you know, when you're writing for the theater, you can say it's a sunny afternoon in Harlem. It's 1930. 
And then the lighting designer and the clothing designer, the costume designer, and the, everybody has to make it look like that. In a novel, you have to be the designer. You not only have to write the dialogue and the plot and the characters, you have to design the show. You have to talk about what the light was like. You have to talk about what the clothes were like. And that was very different um, for me. And I also was intimidated because novelists are, and my husband is a novelist, so I love novelists, but they're a very arrogant group. They think they know everything. And as a playwright, I'm used to collaboration. I'm used to inviting other people's opinions. Novelists don't tend to do that. But it was a, a difficult transition because I was trying to be somebody else. I was trying to, you know, be in the tradition of Alice Walker and Toni Morrison and all that. And if you want to give yourself writer's block, try to be in their company when you're first trying to write a novel. So I wrote about a hundred pages that was just torturous. I mean, it was hard for me. I wasn't having any fun. I'm sure it read terrible. And I threw it all away um, and said, okay, I need to start again. And I kind of stomped around my house for a couple of weeks um, in a terrible mood because 100 pages is a lot to throw away. Yeah. But then I said, I'm a playwright. I can do this as a monologue. I can let this woman speak first person and tell the story that I'm trying to tell. And that's what I did. I started thinking of it as a long monologue. And that book went from being a very, very difficult, never would have finished it, third person attempt to be a serious novelist, to being a playwright with a story and letting a character tell that story. And once I kind of got that um, together, I actually had a, had a good time with it. But I still, if I had to pick um, of all of the different kinds of expressions um, that I've been able to explore as a writer, theater is always my favorite because writing is a very solitary activity. Um, there, there becomes a point where you have to um, stop talking about how wonderful it's going to be. Stop, you know, drinking wine with your friends in the kitchen and saying it's going to be this, it's going to be that. You actually have to put them out, go somewhere and write it down and do that work. But if you're doing it for the theater, you have that alone time, that isolation that you must have as a writer. But then when you come out, you're a part of a tribe. You've got actors and directors and designers and producers and all of those things so that it it really is a perfect balance between the solitary part of writing and the part that does not occur in any other form where you get to be with other people making this story come alive, making um, a way to show this story to an audience. And then of course, that's that final moment when you have to really just be brave and invite the audience in because otherwise you're just in rehearsal until you invite the audience. And that I think is is always exciting because you never know. Um, you know, you may think that joke at the top of act two is really hysterical and the audience may not think so at all. And as a playwright, you get to sit in the back of the theater and hear whether or not it's working. You know, did they understand that? Was that clear? Did it make sense? Was it funny? Was it sad? All of those things which are nerve wracking um, but which are so wonderful when it all comes together because then we're right there in a group of people that came into a place as strangers who may not have known the person sitting to their right, to their left at all. And if the playwright and the people on the stage and the people behind the scenes, if we all do our work correctly, at the end of that show, the people will turn to the stranger on either side of them and have to say something about the play. They'll have to talk about what they just saw. They'll have to talk about what they just heard. And that's, I think, still one of the most amazing um, and pleasurable ways to build community, to experience something cultural together um, and then be able to sing it together, talk about it together, um, dance it together, all of those things. And I, I think that, that theater does that so beautifully that I, I miss it. You know, novels are lonesome. You write them by yourselves, people read them by themselves, you know, theater, it's all of us together in a big mess, which is what appeals to me about it. Yeah. And I know we were just talking about the, um, a little before about the, the pandemic. And I feel like this gathering that we're doing at the theater again is so healing um, from that iso that period of isolation and the importance of what you're talking about, of laughing at the same thing with someone you don't know or crying in the same moment with someone you don't know, that it just, it, brings that connectedness back into focus, which feels so key. Um, and that we get to gather in the making of it and gather in the experiencing of it is so beautiful. Um, your place covers so many different subject matters and points in history, um, whether Kansas in 1898, Harlem in 1930, Montgomery in 1964, 
Where do you find the inspiration for these different periods and characters? Um, the character usually uh, comes to me first. Um, and it's almost always a woman, not always, uh, but um, the character comes first. And it's, I don't know where they come from. It's just, you know, something that will spark something in me that is of interest to me. Um, but I know it's going to have to be a character that I want to spend a year with because it takes that long to write a play, write a novel. It takes that long. So I'm always looking for a character that is of interest to me and will remain interesting to me um, for a year. So that that's, that's kind of where it starts. And then I do a lot of character work. Um, I do a lot more pre-writing than I do rewriting. I do lots and lots of stuff asking myself about um, these characters, you know, who are they? And I have a, a chart that's like 37 questions. And it, it kind of starts off lulling you into a false sense of security, asking you things like, you know, what's her name and what's her favorite color and things like that. And then it goes to what's her problem? How's it going to get worse? How's wow. she going to work on that? All of those things that take you seamlessly into plot. And plot is always hard for me, but it's much easier if I can come to it through the character and not try to superimpose the plot um, on these characters. So that I do um, a lot of thinking about, you know, who are these people? And when I first started using this particular uh, character chart that my husband gave me, um, and when I got to the part where it was like favorite color, I was like, I don't need to know that. You know, I'm not going to be talking about what this woman's favorite color is. And I realized that if you do each one of those questions um, that are on that chart, what you end up with at the end is not only wonderful guidance about what your plot is going to be, but also it forces you to think specifically about these characters so they're not you pretending to be Angel, pretending to be Delia, pretending to be Mrs. Dunbar, pretending to be someone else, but it's really me because I haven't taken the time to differentiate between who I am and who they are. So that I think about them in all kinds of ways. You know, I walk through the grocery store and think, what would Angel buy in here? You know, does she like tomatoes? Does she like fruit? Does she like, you know, what does she eat? Only to keep her alive in my head and to make sure that she's not just me walking through the grocery store. Not just me saying, okay, I like Bob Marley, so she's going to like Bob Marley. She may hate Bob Marley, but I have to get to that by knowing that she's not me. Mm -hmm. So that I think that that's the, um, the part that is the... The most challenging, but also the part that gives you a way into the story. You know, who are these people and what are they going to do when they meet each other? Um, and that's the fun of it um, for me to develop the characters and then see how they're going to come together, what they're going to do when they bounce off each other. But it's many times when people will say to me, oh, I had a great idea, but I just it turned out it wasn't such a great idea. And many times what they're describing as writer's block or bad idea is really that they don't really have the craft experience to know how to make those characters different from who they are, how to understand that you have to know, for me, on page one, what's going to happen on the last page. And I have friends who say, oh, I just start writing. I don't outline anything in advance. I just start writing. And that's always mysterious to me. I don't know how you do that. You know, mm -hmm. how do you know what to leave in? How do you know what to take out if you don't know where you're going? You know, because if you don't know where it's going to end up, it can be everywhere. I mean, it can be all over Atlanta, head by Chicago, go through D.C., go to California. You know, how can you possibly know? So that I'm always very clear about the necessity for the discipline to make yourself figure out who this person is, where they are, and what they're talking about. You know, the part that I really love about writing plays is, is the dialogue. I love to make the people talk. But they can't just wander around on the stage and talk, even if they're talking beautifully. After a certain point, people are like, but what are they doing? Where are they going? So you have to know what they're talking about and where that conversation is going to take them. And that's really the fun of it, you know, to try to figure all that out. In the 37 questions, you said that the, your, those are your husband's questions? Did he do yeah, that? he found it in like a writer's magazine. He's a he's a writer too, right, and he right. gave it to me. He offered it to me um, one time, and it was just such a useful um, tool. It's almost like a magic spell, you know. But of course, the first time I used it, I was like, "Eh, I'm not doing the favorite color. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that." And I'd realized you have to do it. You have to do it all in order. And if you do, by the time you get to the end, it really saves unlimited wailing and gnashing of teeth because you know what you're doing. 
Wow. What a, what a cool tool. I'm, um, I'm wondering too about these moments in history that you, that you transport us to in your work. How do you choose which moment and where? They're the moments that are interesting to me. You know, I wrote Flying West because I was so fascinated by the idea of um, groups of black women leaving Memphis, Tennessee and going in groups walking, um, you know, to Kansas. So the idea of walking from Memphis to Kansas is just in and of itself an amazing thing. But that groups of women would go together to do this, like a, a church group would all go and people who did not have husbands, brothers, fathers, men who were going to make this trek women would get together in groups and, and make this, um, make this journey. And it, it was so fascinating to me. And I'd read lots and lots of letters, home journals that people kept all of that. And it dawned on me that a lot of the things that these women in 1898, in the middle of the prairie in Kansas, were thinking about and struggling with and dealing with were so similar to the things that I was struggling with and thinking about and dealing with um, as a contemporary person, you know, living in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was fascinating to me to just look at um, at how then I could translate those things together. Um, for Blues for an Alabama Sky, I, I grew up, as I said, with my mother reading Langston Hughes so that I was surrounded by the Harlem Renaissance. And that play initially, I wanted to put in the heart of the Harlem Renaissance. But we often will do that. We'll write about the part of the Renaissance when everything was wonderful. You know, as Langston Hughes said, when the Negro was in vogue, you know, when we had patrons and we had nightclubs and everything was going great. Then the Great Depression came and all of those patrons did not have money to put in an art exhibition, did not have money to put into somebody writing a jazz score for something. They were trying to stay alive. And it occurred to me that it would be much more interesting to write about the end of that Renaissance. What is it like to come out of a time when you think everything is going to be great? Now I'm going to be an artist forever. This is so lovely. And then all of a sudden it all comes to a close. What does that feel like? So that it, it really, I think for, you know, um, for me, it comes from a period of time that for some reason calls to me. I mean, writing Nakarima Society and thinking about the movement, about the civil rights movement, I was very much involved in um, activist work. And I know that when we tell the stories now of the 60s, we often will act as if um, everyone in the black community was an activist. Everybody marched with Dr. King. Everybody thought it was a great idea. And that just wasn't true. Some people were really not happy with all of these wild eyed radicals um, causing all this confusion. They wanted things to go slow and not upset the apple cart, um, usually people who were doing pretty well. So that there's there's always a, a something about a period, either because I've lived through it or because I've imagined myself living through it, that call me um, forward for these things. And then it gives me an excuse to actually read about it, you know, to find the photographs, to look at these people's faces, you know, to listen to their journals, to think about what their letters home were about and all of those things. But it, there has to be something about the period that, you know, that really is speaking to me. And I don't always know why, but I've learned that if it keeps coming up, I trust it enough um, to know that it's, there's probably a story in there looking for me. So I always try to, to go in there and let it find me if it can. Wow. And do you, is it the period and the inspiration of the period in place and then the character springs out of that or is it the character first or it could happen in any order? It's kind of the, the character, um, the character kind of, because when I start thinking about the character, they occur somewhere, you know, they have to be someplace mm -hmm. so that there's a time and a place where they kind of occur so that all of that kind of starts coming in from like a distance and then it gets, you know, um, more focused and more focused. But it's the, the the character, you know, like a character for Angel in Blues for an Alabama Sky. Um, you know, I, I saw Angel and Guy being friends and I saw their friendship. You know, I saw them in these clubs um, in my imagination. You know, I saw them um, being friends and her being broke and him, you know, trying to get to Paris and all of those things. And I could see their friendship um, as something that was very complicated. Um, but was critical to both of them. So that they kind of came to me at the same time as I realized the period was a period of crisis for them. Um, and I was able to, to kind of bring them forward in that way. And that's such an interesting piece to me because at the same time, I'm looking at 
a social worker who's trying to open a birth control clinic and a, a doctor who is performing illegal abortions. And the, you know, when people say to me, wow, aren't you glad that some of these issues are still so timely after 25 years because the play is 25 years old. And as a playwright, of course, you're always glad that your work continues to speak to people. But I wish it wasn't so timely. I wish we weren't still dealing with questions of a woman's right to have control over her own body. I wish we weren't still dealing with poverty. I wish we weren't still dealing with that kind of small mindedness that Leland um, represents. But I, I think that that part of what theater can do if we do it right is to make these questions come forward um, not necessarily just the year that you write the play, but after that, because the, the issues will change, but human beings and the choices that they have to make will often be very much um, the same in terms of looking at uh, what are these people going to do? You know, how are they going to survive? How are they going to be friends? How are they going to learn how to tell the truth to each other? You know, how can they fall in love with each other in the midst of all of this madness and confusion? And those are still the characters, the, the questions that we're asking now, you know, how do we how do we proceed through all of this craziness and still manage to have some peace and joy, you know, in our lives? Something I really marvel at in your work is how it's both timeless and timely. Mm -hmm. And or the, the way you just explained that helps me understand how that can be true. It's both specific to the period, but it's also examining something that is timeless and human. And mm -hmm. It is tragic that the specific issues continue to reoccur, um, but also he, there will be issues, not hopefully not those same issues in the future, but there's something quintessential about humanity that you're examining that will continue to just speak, will continue to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes when we think about the issues that are raised in a play, people don't come to the theater in my experience to talk about issues they will do it and they'll suffer through and they you know they soldier on when they realize that it's going to be an issues play and they're going to have to think about these things and either feel guilty or angry or whatever it is but i think that what brings people to the theater is a story you know it's like turn out the lights let me sit in the dark and tell me a story and it's such an ancient impetus um mm -hmm. And I love that a lot. You know, it's a campfire, you know, it's caves, you know, sitting outside the caves, people trying to tell the story of the tribe. Who is the, the brave woman? Who is the woman who, who is going to lead us to something good? Who is the man who exhibits good characteristics that we love? And I think that that idea of coming together in community to listen to a story is what continues to bring us um, to the theater. So I'm always very careful, especially um, being an activist person, to not confuse being an activist with being an artist. And they overlap, of course. But I think that if you can find a story that draws people to the questions you wanna consider um, as a writer, if you can find a story that will allow them to reach that um, consideration of the issue through their emotions, through their heart, rather than through their head, you have a much better chance of getting them to see things differently. Because if you come straight through our intellect, through our brain, we're going to have 20 arguments for you before you get through half a sentence. You know, we'll argue it. We will confront it. We will have, you know, very rational reasons about it. But if you can make me feel something about a character, all of that goes out the window. Then I'm worried about Angel. You know, what's going to happen to Angel? What's going to happen to Guy? What about Doc? You know, what about Delia? What about poor Leland who thought he was, you know, grown and then he came up from Tuskegee, Alabama and landed in Harlem and said, oh, my God, who are these Philistines? But it's it's really, I think, the the idea that if we can find a character that the audience can love or not love, but respond to emotionally, they're much more likely to be able to consider the issues that you want them to think about than they would be if you come to the front of the stage and berate them um, about something. And I came of age in the 60s, so I sat through many, many plays where people came to the front of the stage and berated the audience for things. And it's like, wait, why are you fussing with us? We're here. We're trying to do what you want us to do. So I'm always looking for that, that story that will draw them in, draw them toward me, rather than make them resist me. Because um, if I do it right, they won't be able to resist the characters. They'll have to go with Angel. They'll have to go with Guy. You know, and that's that's what I'm always looking for. I want that moment in the theater. And you know this moment where people lean forward 
because they want to be closer to what's going on on the stage. And I always sit in the back so that if it's not going well, I give myself permission to run out of the theater, which I haven't had to do yet. But I, I love watching from the back because you can see people lean forward. And it's just like, it's, it's a great feeling. There is no better feeling than that. I'm thinking too about your use of humor, that that is one, uh, one of the many ways that you, we feel it here before we think about it here. Mm -hmm. And there is so much at the heart of blues and there's so um, much uh, tumult for the characters, but you laugh the whole way through the play. Mm -hmm. And so the experience of it is, an ex is a joyful experience and a heart-wrenching experience and that uh, really resonates uh, for me with what you're saying, um, that it's about feeling it here first um, and receiving the story, all the elements of the story. Yeah. Um, it, uh, for us, for Rumi Bumbo, it's such an honor to be part of the Clegg Festival um, <laughs> that the Goodman is hosting and um, and to have blues at Remy, of course, right now. Um, and in watching the play over and over again, uh, I, there are so many things that I get to appreciate more and more. Um, and one of my favorite things about the piece is that it centers around a group of friends. And I've noticed this a, a few times in your work that the primary relationships are not necessarily romantic relationships. And although romantic relationships factor in, um, that is not necessarily the center of the story. And I love that. And I'm curious if that, um, how, that's, uh, how that has, has come into play for you. Um, I think probably because I, I have good friends, you know, I, I love my friends. I have been so fortunate to have, um, you know, like a very, um, core group of friends for, for my whole adult life. And certainly before I was an adult too, as a kid, but just the idea of, um, love affairs are one thing, always wonderful and passionate and all of that. but friendships, um, sometimes are more reliable sometimes go on much longer than the passionate love affairs um, and allow different kinds of exploration of the characters. You know, Angel is a different person around her friends than she is around the men she's trying to seduce. You mm -hmm. know, she's very different. She's much more honest talking to Doc. You know, um, she's much more honest uh, talking to D um, talking to uh, Guy than she is talking to Leland to whom she lies mercilessly all the time. Um, but I think that, that friendships are, are so important to um, grounding yourself um, in your own life. And that if you're lucky, you have friends who will tell you the truth, um, friends to whom you can tell the truth, um, and friends who will love you even when you're not perfect, even when you're a hot mess, even when you are not doing what you said you were gonna do, um, and they believe that you're gonna try to do better. And I think that's part of the reason why it's it's hard for us as an audience to watch Angel just really put her friends in such awful positions because they love her and they know she has weaknesses and they know that she's very much afraid of ending up a broke old woman begging up and down 125th Street and that almost every decision she makes is based on fear. And I believe that the worst decisions human beings ever make are based on fear. And Angel makes almost every decision in that play about fear. And her friends are always trying to kind of soothe her and say, it's going to be okay. We're going to take care of it. You know, we'll figure out a way to pay the rent. We'll figure out a way to do this. we got a dress you can wear. We can, whatever it is, we will take care of it. But she never really believes it because that fear is always there saying, but what if they don't? What if they don't? So that she ends up um, lying to people. She ends up doing things that are so destructive, you know, that set in motion things that she never would have wanted um, to happen. But that fear um, was overriding everything. And I think that's that's part of what the tragedy of that play is, that the, the friendships that were destroyed by um, the fear that Angel had for her own safety and her own future. Yeah, I'm thinking about that line, uh, that guy has truth or solace. Yeah. And what a great line. I like that line too. <laughs> Thank you. That's one of my favorite lines. Yeah. Like, right, yeah. Because that's a great really question. It's like, okay, am I going to tell you the truth or am I just soothing you right now? Let me know because I'll do whichever one you want. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah, and you. And that's, that's a great friend. You know, yeah. are you, do you need the truth a little later? And right now what you need is comfort. I, I, yeah, I very struck by that. Um, 
uh, in your work, and we just touched on this with Angel, you create such complex characters. And I'm curious about the craft, I suppose, in a way of of how, how you do that thing that you talked about, which is get us to care about a character who is making decisions based in fear, who is ruining relationships. How, how do you get us so invested in characters who are deeply flawed? I think um, I have to have compassion for them as a writer. I can't judge them. I can't say um, Angel is terrible because of, of lying to Doc. Angel is awful for lying to Leland. Angel is, you know, because if I'm judging them um, as the writer, then the way I write them is going to encourage the audience to judge them as well, rather than being able to recognize human frailty, to be able to recognize the flaws in other people, which we also can recognize in ourselves if we're honest. But I think that the, the whole idea of being able to say, I'm going to write this person and I don't find her behavior admirable, but I understand her. I understand fear. You know, I understand that Angel was raised in a, a terrible environment, abused in every kind of way, you know, frightened in every kind of way, on her own, you know, in a in a, a house of ill repute in Savannah. I mean, all of those things so that I understand where her fear comes from and how determined she has been not to be poor ever again, all of that. So that I think that the, um, the thing that I am always challenged by is to make sure that I can love this person, even if I don't like everything they do, even if they do things that I find are terrible. Um, Leland was the hardest one for mm. me, actually, um, to, to get past judging him because he's so different um, than, than I would be. Um, he believes um, in things that I do not believe in and believes that he has a right to impose his views on people so that it was difficult for me to figure out a way to love him. But that's part of what my job has to be. I have to love all of them and forgive them and then I can write about them, which is not to say I want the audience to always forgive them. You know, there are things where you have to judge them and say that's that's terrible, you know, that's really awful what happened. But as the writer, I have to have some compassion for them. I remember when we first did uh, Blues, a group of um, girls from Spelman College, which is where I graduated all women's school um, here in Atlanta. And they came to see the show and about four or five of them waited for me afterwards. So I was like, oh great, my Spelman sisters, this is wonderful. So we were talking and they were really upset with me. And I said, what is wrong? What is wrong? And they were angry because Angel didn't get to go to Paris. And they were like, they wanted me to find a way to forgive her so she could go to Paris. And I had to sit down with them and say, everybody can't go to Paris. Everybody can't be a good friend. Everybody can't be forgiven because they haven't changed. Do you think Angel was different at the end of the play than at the beginning of the play? And they all were like, well, no, but we want you to fix her. That's what they told me. We want you to fix her, you know, because they're used to reading my work. And most of the time, the Black women don't do bad things. They may make mistakes, but they don't do bad things. Angel is probably the first Black woman character that I've written about, you know, where she did some things where she had to take responsibility for that. But it was such an interesting discussion because they were like, you know, well, that's your job. Fix it make her okay so she can go. And I said, oh, y'all are so young. You think people can just get fixed. You know, you're 18, wait till you're 25 and come back and tell me whether or not you would want to go to Paris with her, knowing she would repeat everything that, that she's done. But that I think the their desire to forgive her and see her have what she wants was very moving to me um, because they, they knew she had done something really awful and that bad things had happened to her friends, but they understood where that fear came from and they wanted me to fix her, you know, so she could go. So that it was, it was interesting. I think I sent them out, you know, out into the night feeling like, oh, life is much harder than we thought it was gonna be. <laughs> but it's like, that's what theater can do too. Let you see how much more complicated things are than you might've thought they were. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm just thinking about the fan fiction that could emerge about what happens to, to <laughs> Angel after the show. <laughs> well, that's, you know, people wanted me to write up um, the. They did this. Uh, they did this piece in in London last year, and um, the people the the people who did it 
um, at the National Theater. They wanted me to to write another play about Guy in Paris. You know, we need to know what Guy's doing in Paris. And the actor who played Guy was so amazing and wonderful. It was like, I wish I had a story in my head about Guy in Paris, but I don't. But I swear, if I do, I will write it and send it to you all instantly. But they they wanted that. They wanted to, you know, to see, okay, once he gets there, does Delia stay? Does she go? You know, does she actually, does he actually get to do these costumes for for um, Josephine Baker. And I said, of course he does. Of course he does. And they're fabulous and wonderful, but I don't have a play about that. So if it comes, I'll do it. But I love that they wanted more. They wanted that fan fiction thing. Like, okay, we're going to yeah. take him to Paris, right? Yes. We'd all like to go to Paris with Guy. <laughs> with Guy, you know, it would be fabulous. You know it would. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, in your book, Things I Should Have Told My Daughter, you speak about your willingness to share your journals with your granddaughter and your family. Um, and of course, you do share some of your journals in, in the book. Um, I'm curious about your relationship to journaling and how you decide which part of that interior life is available to others. Um, I've kept diaries and journals since I was 11 years old. So I have them everywhere. They're stashed all over. Um, and I just, I'd write every day in a journal. It's like, I think of it really like um, playing scales. If I was a musician, um, going to ballet class, if I was a dancer, you know, where you, you just kind of, something that revs you up every day. So that even if I'm not working on a project, I, I need to play those scales. I need to do it. And I, um, I try not to be uh, precious about my journals you know like I have friends who are writers who are um, so uh, obsessed with making sure their journals read beautifully and all that so that when you know they're found in a hundred years people will say oh this was a great writer and too bad we didn't make her famous when she was alive and all that I don't think about that my journals are full of true confessions and whining and not wanting to go to the grocery store and you know just everything because it's it's just trying to um to make sure that I'm putting words on paper um and I find that if I start with anything even you know and this the reason that this one comes to me is this is often the one about no oh, I don't want to go to the grocery store I don't want to cook I don't want to do that kind of thing but if you start there and you're sitting there and my office is right in the um, we live in a corner house so I can see my neighbors and it's like if I'm sitting at my desk whining about something and then I can see something happening in the street then I'll write it down you know what did I see what did that look like? You know, who is this? And what did, what, you know, why did they get that little dog? And what, if, what is my neighbor doing planting? And what about, so that it, it becomes a, a way to start. And then you can um, go from the whining into things that you might actually be able to use. Um, I was, was kind of taken aback when my daughter was so adamant that she did not have any interest in my giving these journals to her daughter, who was about three at the time, but um, I wasn't thinking of giving them to her until she was about 16. But she was like, no, they don't need to know. She doesn't need to know all that. And I was like, well, you've never read these diaries. And she said, well, I was there. And I said, oh, that's true. She was. She had lived through all of that with me. But it's funny because my granddaughter that I was thinking about, my oldest granddaughter, I have three, but this one is the oldest one. Um, she's now a, a sophomore at Howard University studying musical theater, but I don't think she's ever read that book. Um, and I don't think her mother has encouraged her to read that book. But it's funny to me because it is actual entries from my journals. And there's, you know, I mean, I did human things. I'm not a perfect grandmother, but I can't imagine if my grandmother had written a book where she talks about all the stuff that I talk about in that book that I wouldn't have run to read it instantly. And I don't think any of my grandchildren have ever opened it. You know, I have from 21 to nine, the nine-year-old, of course, wouldn't read it. But, you know, I don't think they, I think that they're, uh, that they make a distinction between me, the public person who writes books, write plays, all of that, and their grandmother. And I think they'd rather just have their grandmother. You know, they probably, if they ever opened it, they were like, oh, no, we don't need to know all this about granny. We just want to go get pizza. We don't really want that. And I respect that. You know, it's hard for a family to have a writer in it because we tell everything. You know, we're shameless. And it's, you know, not only do we tell everything about ourselves, but if we're not really conscious, we tell too much about them. And I'm always trying not to do that, you know, not to cannibalize my own life in a way that, um, you know, that in some way uh, hurts my family, makes them feel like their privacy has been invaded and all of that. But, but for myself, I just feel like I don't, um, 
I don't believe in secrets. I don't have any secrets anymore. There was a time when mm -hmm. I did have secrets, but I don't have any anymore. It's like, you know, I tried to tell a, a group of writing students one time at Spelman again. They were so nervous about, you know, their first assignment. I can't remember what I asked them to write about, but I realized they were nervous about shocking me. And I wanted to say, you can't shock me. Trust me on this. You cannot shock me. No one in this room is going to think up a new sin. Everything that y'all have done at age 18, not only have I probably done, but everybody, your mom, your grandmom, all of us, these sins are old. So just write about what you're going to write about. I'm not going to judge it, whatever it is. But I, I was so surprised that they were nervous about shocking their teacher because, of course, they don't see me as a person who was ever their age. You know, they see me as a 70 year old professor mm -hmm. so that it's like they can't imagine um, that I would be uh, struggling at a certain point with the same things that they're struggling with, doing some of the same foolish things that they did. And that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to write that book because uh, young women will come to me and, and act as if um, my whole life has been as certain as I am about things as I am at this age. And I want to say, no, you know, when I was 20, my life was messy, 30, messy, 40, messy. Life is messy. It's going to be messy. It's going to be different kinds of messy, but that's what it's going to be. So don't think that because you encounter me in a public setting and I'm being, you know, serene and hopefully wise and, you know, telling you things that you should know um, that I've never had to figure out anything that I've never paced around and wailed and, you know, figured I was messing up everything. Um, because that's what you do. And then you figure it out and move ahead. But it's a, I think it's always funny to, um, to find people who want to present to their children and their grandchildren this perfect idea that, mm -hmm. you know, we never had affairs. We never smoked any marijuana. We never stayed out late. You know, we did all that and more. I listen to these people talking to their grandchildren and say, wait a minute. I know you. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. You know, they'll they'll probably not even care about it. You know, because they can't imagine it. I can't imagine my grandparents at age 25. I don't think anybody can, you know, but it's like, tell them the truth. Don't lie to them um, because then they'll not only judge themselves harshly, but they'll be judging you on something that isn't even true. You know, let them love who you really are. You know, they already love you. You're their grandma, you know, so let them love whatever that is. And then when they encounter other people who are not the perfect grandmotherly image that we might have been fed, they'll understand that grandmothers can be interesting, complicated, dynamic people, just like they are, which I think is probably the most shocking to them. <laughs> yeah, I think it also helps uh, people love themselves because they think there might be, a, a, if not less mess in the future, a different mess in the future. And sometimes that's what hope looks like. Yes. <laughs> you can grow back it. You can say, oh, so glad I figured that out. Now, what's the next thing going to be? Because it's always something. And that's that's the other thing is people waiting for that moment when, you know, and they'll people will talk about this with artistic work. I'm going to wait till everything is good and then I'm going to write. I'm going to wait till mm -hmm. everything is wonderful and then I'm going to start a theater company, act, direct, whatever. And it's like, do it in the midst of the upheaval. Do it in the midst of all of what's going on because then all of the passion of that moment is going to come through the work that you're doing. You know, don't wait for everything to settle down, not only because that's not where the fun and the energy probably is, but because it's never going to settle down. Life is not that way. Um, there's always something, always something. And that's, I think, the beauty of it. That's the, the joy of it, to see if you can fix that problem and then go to the next one and help somebody else see you know, what the problem is and fix it and to help people not be so hard on themselves, yeah. not be so mean to themselves, you know, to to create characters. If you're a writer where people can see their own flaws and see somebody on that stage have those flaws and be forgiven um, for it, you know, because we are so hard on ourselves. And I think more now in this country than I probably ever can remember because we're so critical of each other. And that feeds on itself so that we fuss at each other. We judge ourselves. We judge each other. And it's just like, we don't, we don't need to do all that. Life is hard enough without all of that. Just trying to figure out how to be a good person and make it through. Yeah. But it's, you know, I, I always laugh about the fact that writers don't write about a whole hundreds of things. You know, we write about family stories, war stories, love stories, community, 
um, stories, but they're they're all because we as human beings all over the world are looking for the same thing. You know, we want peace, we want love, we want friends, we want to sit on the porch and drink lemonade and wave at our neighbors. You know, we want to be able to grow old in peace, and we all want that. And if we can find a way to to tell stories that show us the possibility of that, I think we always embrace those stories. You know, why do people do Our Town every year all over the world, all over the country? Because it's it's that moment of saying, well, it's true. It's exhausting. You know, so every every day the earth has to, everybody has to take a break and then come back the next day and try to make something out of ourselves. And it's, you know, it's, it's exhausting, but it's so um, intriguing. It's so challenging. It's so uh, wonderful to be a fully alive human being you know, to look at people. I am never, ever bored. You know, people talk about, oh God, they have to stand in line here, stand in line here. I don't care. I'm listening to what the people are saying who are complaining behind me. I'm watching the person in front of me who is doing whatever they're doing. Um, human beings are endlessly fascinating to me. Um, and I love to watch them and they love for you to watch them. So it works out good. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, yes. Well, I think we have some uh, questions from our audience. So, Allison, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And just a, a quick reminder for folks who are watching at home, um, type in your questions in the Q&A box and we'll see how many we can get to. Uh, the first question uh, for Pearl is from Camille, who wants to know, are there any of your current books you would like to see performed as plays? Um. No, I don't think of the, the books ever as being plays. Novels are very difficult to, to translate onto the stage um, just because too many characters, too many settings, all that. Um, it would be more interesting to me to see if they could be films, but I'm not a filmmaker, so I don't um, have any real impact with that. But I, I don't think of, of ever turning them um, into plays. There's a character in some of my, um, I wrote um, several novels that were set in Atlanta. And there's a male character in there named Blue Hamilton. Um, and it's a very popular character. So people used to stop me when the books first would come out and say, okay, when are we gonna see him on the stage? When are we gonna see him on the stage? And I'd say, but you can already see him in your imagination. That's why you love him. And I never had a photograph of him. It's you, your imagination has already created him. So I don't have to put him on the stage. You've already got him and they're like, yeah, but Idris Elba, that's who it needs to be. I'm like, of course it, of course it needs to be Idris Elba, but I don't have any plans for them to um, to be plays, but movies, I would be open to that. I have a question from Jana who wants to know, who are some of the author playwright inspirations for your writing? Um, I think the two uh, people that I would have to uh, say were the most influential um, for me are Lorraine Hansberry, who I mentioned before with Raisin in the Sun, um, and also Intisaki Shange, um, who is such a force for um, African-American women playwrights of my generation. Um, I remember going to see For Colored Girls um, and sitting in like the fifth row of the theater. And I had read about it, read about it, and I had been longing to see it. And it came um, to Atlanta. They mounted it at the Alliance Theater. And I was so in awe of that play. I started crying about maybe 10 minutes into the play and I wept throughout the play. And it was like, not quiet little tears running down. I mean, I was actually making noise. You know, I had to calm myself because it was so amazing to see my life, the lives of the women that I knew, all of us in our generation, especially since she was writing about being an artist, you know, that all of us, could see ourselves there. And you don't realize how much you have longed for that until you see it. And then it just like, you know, it just, it made me cry. I was so happy and so moved and so stirred up by it. And I remember leaving the theater that night and saying to myself, okay, I have to, if I'm gonna do this, then I have to tell the truth that strong. I have to be prepared to say everything, even the hard things and the last, scene of that, um, you know, there's a terrible scene in that play where the Vietnam veteran who has lost his mind and he drops his children out the window. You know, it's like, how can you possibly wrap your mind about writing that? And she did it in a way that, that is unforgettable. But I, I think uh, Intisaki and um, 
uh, Lorraine Hansberry are the two that really made me see that I could write about things that I knew and that not only was it legitimate, but it could be transcended. We have a question here from Joan who wants to know, um, in Blues, which character came first? And she also wants to know if fear is a motivation that often leads your characters. Um, fear is a, is definitely a motivation that, um, that leads characters, um, because it's a good, strong one. You know, fear is going to make you make a move. Um, and you're always looking for something as a playwright to make somebody make a move. Um, but the characters in, uh, uh, in blues, I would say that, that Angel and Guy kind of came together, um, for me. And I, I realized, um, after I saw that play in its, its first, um, opening and the audience responded so much to Guy. And I realized that Guy is really the person we're following through that play. You know, he's the one who does actually have a dream and he gets to go to Paris to do it at the end. So that was kind of um, interesting to me to watch him as the character that the audience was so um, invested in. Um, because I think Angel scared him a little bit, you know, because she was such a unpredictable unpredictable force but it's one of the the things that was a real pleasure for me about about guy was that i watched heterosexual men in the audience who probably were um not as progressive on questions of of meeting gay men as they should have been but they all liked guy because guy didn't take any stuff you know, when he goes out and the people are, are um, the little hoodlums are bothering him and he comes home and there's some blood on his shirt and Angel is like, oh my God, you're bleeding. And he says, no, I'm not, but somebody is because he carries a straight razor. And I watched the, the men in the audience who were not gay respond to him man to man. And my hope always is if you can respond to somebody in a play in a way that is humane and, and open to other human beings who might be different than you, then perhaps it'll give you a little bit more of a chance that you'll do it outside of the theater too, that you won't carry those attitudes with you because you will have related to a character that was so unlike you and you realize you loved him. I have time for one more question. Um, and we're gonna, I think we should take this one from Beverly who wants to know, when do you know that a writing project is finished and ready to share with the world? <laughs> That's such a terrible question. I have no idea. It's just, I think there is a moment when you know, but you have to trust it because it's, you know, the, the, the danger always is that you'll hold on to it too long. You'll overwrite it. You'll second guess yourself. And there is always a moment when I feel like, okay, I've said what I had to say. Now let me see if anyone else can hear it if I did my work well enough so that when I offer it, it will be received in the way that I intended. Um, but it's it's really um, like wondering where do the ideas come from? How do you know when it's done? All of that is a process of learning as an artist how to trust yourself, how to know that when you say it's done, you can believe yourself and say, okay, now it's done. Now it's ready for me to offer it and be secure that if people can receive it, wonderful. But if they don't, I'm offering it complete. Um, and that's my gift. I want to thank both of you for the conversation that you've offered us here tonight and for this wonderful discussion of writing and your work. Um, just to let folks know, I am going to uh, put the links to the American Writers Museum and to the Remy Bumpo Theater in the chat one more time. Um, those are in there if you take a look. And um, hopefully everyone can join me in thanking you both again for this wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pearl. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.